Good morning. It's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman. I'm the content executive at Higher Things. And joining me today for the very first time, I'm so happy to have David Zills here. He is uh, an engineer by trade, uh, but he is an apologist. And that's a fun big word that I'm going to let him define. David, how are you doing today? Uh, doing well. Yeah, good to be here. Great to have you. So um, apologist. So most people sort of hear the word apology and they think I'm sorry for something. But it, it's more than that, right? Yeah. Um apologist um it's a goes back to the greek word ap- apologia um it's kind of the sense of giving an answer first peter three fifteen for the reason for the hope that we have so um an apologetic or apologetics can refer to reasons for why you believe what you believe um and these could be obviously we all have different reasons for how we come to believe what we believe but christian apologetics tends to focus on objective reasons um historical sometimes philosophical philosophical or scientific um kind of these things that say um yeah this believing in the Bible isn't just something that you just have to have a blind leap in the dark and just hope it works out and just, just believe by faith and that's it, you know, but there are actually reasons that we can have confidence that our hope is secure and it's not wishful thinking. Um, so that's something I've become passionate about kind of through my own journey of wrestling with, how do I know these things my parents taught me are actually real? Right. This is uh, one of those things that if you're just going to let the Bible be sort of this cornered off part of your life where I believe it, but I definitely don't want to think too hard about it because then I might unbelieve it. Uh, it, it. It makes it really, really hard to actually find comfort for the stuff that's going on. It makes the the little doubts just get bigger and bigger. You you talked about your own kind of personal doubts. I've, I've sure had mine. Um, so uh, is this sort of what got you started then in, in apologetics? Uh very much so. It was something I got into just out of my own need because, um, yeah, I grew up in a, a Lutheran family. My grandpa taught at the Fort Wayne Seminary. Um, my dad grew up there, was an elder at our LCMS church. And, you know, my dad taught me catechism and all that. And then a little bit in junior high, I started to learn about different ideas that were non Christian and started to learn how to think critically to some extent about, you know, how do I know what I know? And I started, that started to shake my confidence that these things I had been taught were real. And I started wanting something beyond my parents, you know, faith kind of to own it for myself. And, um, and then in college, I went to a, that, that was for me, my first time out of a Christian bubble, um, And I was in classes where professors and students were making jabs at Christian faith and kind of either openly stating or kind of hinting that it was really dumb and you can't take this seriously and smart people don't believe this anymore. We're we're all much more civilized and rational than to believe these superstitions. And so uh, it was one thing to have them saying that, but the thing that really made it hard for me was I kind of wondered if they were right because I had these doubts going back to junior high. And so, I mean, they were posing questions, but I had my own questions and I really had a, I got really depressed. And I remember thinking, you know, it's really comforting to believe the Bible message that God loves me. Like God's love is a powerful a powerful resource for navigating the difficulties of life. And it anchors you when people don't like you or when things aren't going well, you can always go back to, you know, the creator thought I was important enough to make. And he loved me enough that even though I, um, I rebel against him time and time again, he keeps pursuing me like that's powerful, but I wanted to believe it, but I couldn't just, believe it because I wanted to I wanted to know it not just hope and uh so yeah that I got really depressed and the turning point for me was when I saw um, a guy named Josh McDowell give a talk and he was kind of saying things that I had been thinking but I didn't think I was allowed to think in Christian circles I thought in Christian circles if you question faith it was kind of like taboo like you're not supposed to question this stuff and josh mcdowell his his journey was he was an atheist agnostic and 
really got along with some Christians in college and they, but he loved to make fun of their beliefs because obviously they're nonsense. And some of his friends said, well, why don't you prove it wrong? And so he's like, fine, I'll prove that you guys are wrong. And he took a couple years and came to the conclusion that no, 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 historically Christianity is on solid footing. The facts about Jesus very firmly point to the conclusion that Jesus is God in the flesh and that because of that, he is a unique authority to speak into life in a way no one else can, because he has insight kind of from the top down. And all of us are just sort of down here trying to go from the t- bottom up. So hearing him kind of say this and affirm, almost affirm my doubts was powerful. And I thought, okay, it's okay to ask these questions, number one. And number two, here are some places I can start looking for answers. And that was a turning point for me. And that's really how I got into this because I wanted to know that these comforting truths, if they were true, I wanted to know were they were they actually true or were they wishful thinking? And I, you know, might as well believe in the tooth fairy, you know? Right. There's a big difference between my parents' faith and my faith. Um, it's, it's, I can know all of the details, the ins and outs, but I mean, the Bible says Satan knows all those too. It doesn't actually help. Um, and so when you're actually struggling with things, it, it's, it's frustrating that even as, as Lutherans, especially, uh, we have a catechism that tells us like, I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But we think that once we're in the faith, it's our job to sort of wrestle those doubts away by just sort of not thinking about them, but they only fester and they only grow. And the idea that we're not allowed to talk about it as if this is the one sin that Jesus would not forgive. This is the one weakness that he would not carry us through. This is the God who bled and died for you, for me, for all. And, and so it's it's a chance to actually encounter this in, in a way that that isn't just sort of wishful thinking. I, I really like the idea um, you, you raised between the contrast between wishful thinking and, and trust. Um, trust is something you kind of rest on. Um, but at the same time, it's 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 from a God who loves us enough to actually exemplify his 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 existence. Uh, you can poke at this because it's not fragile. You can kick at it because it's supposed to actually be your shield. And a faith that you always have to sort of hide from the rest of the world is absolutely not a faith that you can set in front of you as a shield for when that, that world is happening. Yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, there are some quotes I've seen recently that I think sum up a lot of what you said. One of them said, Um, A faith without doubts is a vulnerable faith, Um, which I, this was Tim Keller, I think he's, and he said, if you, if, if you're not doubting, it means your faith is actually vulnerable because you're not thinking about it deeply enough. So when someone does question it, you know, the, it can be very earth shattering. And the other, uh, someone else, um, one of my college friends said, doubt isn't the problem. It's unexpressed doubt. That's the problem. And I can say that's definitely been true for me as I've wrestled when I keep it to myself. um, And I think it's out of bounds to talk about that's when Satan can kind of get a foothold and say, I'm all alone. And nobody thinks about these things except me. And you know, all these things, but as soon as you can share it with people who can affirm it and walk with you, that's where there's, you know, God, God can work with that. And to your point about, um, you know, does God see doubt as a sin? I think there might be some kinds of doubt that could be motivated by sin. Like, I don't want to believe this because I want to do my own thing, but I don't think a lot of doubt is that way. I think a lot of doubt is just wanting reassurance. Like, I want to be reassured that this is real and that I'm not like hitching my wagon to the wrong, you know, whatever. So um, I think a lot about in terms of what is God's attitude toward doubt. I think a lot about Jesus with John the Baptist um, because John the Baptist, there's one point where he's in prison and he's starting. Yeah. And he thinks, you know, this isn't what the Messiah is supposed to do. I'm in Jesus isn't doing the things the Messiah is supposed to do. And I'm in prison. So like, did I waste my life saying like, follow this guy? Or should we look for another? Yeah. So he sends messengers to Jesus saying, are you actually the Messiah? Or should we look for somebody else? And if doubt was always a sin, Jesus response would have been, 
look how the mighty have fallen. Even John the Baptist, the great prophet, has fallen. So watch yourself, lest you become like him. But that's not at all what he does. He does two things. First, he, he does a bunch of miracles in front of the messengers that John sent. And then he tells the messengers, go tell John, you saw these miracles, and they line up with the Old Testament Jewish prophecies about the Messiah. And so here's mm -hmm. evidence that confirms and can give you confidence. And then the second thing he does is he turns to the crowd and he says, tell, tells them how great John is and how he's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So it's just a very gracious response. And I think, you know, God doesn't create us with minds that crave truth and accuracy and expect us to kind of not apply those with life's biggest questions. That's just, a, that's not his character. He can, he can handle both our soul's craving for meaning and our mind's demands for accuracy. And I think, you know, that to me is very good news. Absolutely. It's, it's one of those profound things that um, we you can get bogged down in whether or not doubt is, is sin, but the reality is, is how Jesus answers it. Um, so with, with so many other sins, it, it's, it's don't do this instead, do this. And so like our catechism again, so uh, you should fear and love God so that you do not uh, take your neighbor's money or possessions and get them in any dishonest way, but instead help and in, to improve and protect his possessions and income that, that we should not do this, but we should do this. But when it comes to the things we wrestle with deep in our soul, he doesn't just say, now believe more. Instead, he does things. So he says, mm. all right, when, when you are weak, when you are sinful, look at what I am doing. A and so it's not a, a call for John to simply like, you know, pull himself up or stop doubting. It's instead an expression of his power, his majesty, his mercy. Um, and so he caps off the whole thing by saying the one who believes is greater than, than John. And where did that belief come from? But Jesus setting forth the Holy Spirit by Jesus preaching, by Jesus affirming his preaching with the, the signs that he did. Um, that, that when you doubt, and, and we were allowed to say when um, and not if, uh, when you doubt, we actually are then called to not only think about the scriptures, but but hear the scriptures for, for your soul, for your, your mind, but even for your body that will rise from the dead just as, as Christ is risen. Um, if we're going to corner off our body from our, our soul, we end up in a weird place with, with mm -hmm. Christianity. It's an old Pharisee called Gnostics. So maybe we'll talk about it someday. Uh, but if we, we sort of corner off our mind from our soul, I, I really like where you're going with this, that it's, it's every bit as dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and I, I like what you said about um, when it comes to faith, God takes the initiative. It's not something we conjure up toward God. I mean, the whole Christian faith is premised on the idea that God took the initiative to reveal himself. And I don't really define faith as a blind leap in the dark, but as a confidence in who God is based on a reliable record of what he's done. And the key is it's a reliable record. It's something that's in history that real people experienced that we can test it historically to see, you know, is this a reliable record? And if it is, then we can look at God's track record. And once we have confidence that God has really done these things, it gives us the confidence that he will also be faithful in the future. So much of the Bible, especially I think in the Old Testament, God's always calling the Israelites to remember remember what I've done. And I think that goes right in with apologetics is it's God's grace to say, I have been faithful and the records of my faithfulness are reliable. They're not fairy tales. And because of that, you can be reassured and confident. Um, so yeah, I think it's all grace from my perspective. That's magnificent. Thank you so much for joining us today, David. Um, I hope you'll come back and we'll talk more about apologetics and kind of get into some of the ins and outs of it. Yeah, no, that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a privilege. All right, have a great one. All right, you too.